Isaiah, the ninth chapter, verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And so the last two weeks, we have asked you this question, what's in the name? Names are important. Your name is important. My name is important. Our names identify us. They tell us something of our, our character and our life. But we've also shared with you that names are important to God. The Bible tells us that God has named all the stars and the planets of the universe and that he doesn't forget any one of those names. Now think about that for a moment. The billions upon billions upon billions and millions and millions of stars. And yet God has named each and every one of them, and he remembers them all by name. I told you about my dad with his five kids, and he'd go down the whole list. If you wanted to talk to me, he'd say, David, Karen, I thought, that you only got five kids. Can't you know which one you're talking to? Until I got to be a dad and a granddad, and I only had two, and I called them. Well, it just happened. Yet God knows each single star by name, and he knows each of your and my names. There are over 7 billion people in the earth today. He not only knows each and every name of every person on this planet, but I will tell you something more. He knows everything about them inside and out. And this omnipotent, omniscient, I'm the present God, loves you and me more than we could ever know or ever could imagine. Yes, names are important to God. As uh, Olivia shared with me uh, last week, the story of Jesus, when the angel spoke to Mary, he told her specifically that you're going to call this child by the name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. His name was specific. It wasn't generic. Paul tells us that this name, the name that we worship here today, Jesus, is a name that's above all other names. And that at that name, that name Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I've told folks, you can either confess him now or you will confess him later. You can do it by choice today and say, Jesus, your Lord. Or there's coming a day where you will bow before him and you will be forced to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Yes, names are important to God. The prophet Isaiah got a glimpse of this awesome name when God revealed to him in chapter 9, verse 6, <clears throat> the scripture I read to you. There were four elements. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. As I said last week, I'm sure Isaiah jumped out of his chair and did a little Jewish dance after he got finished writing that. Because in the Old Testament, they did not know the name of God, but here are characteristics of this name that is coming, this son that is coming, this child that is to be born. His name shall be called I shared with you last week about the wonderful counselor and what a wonder Jesus is. He is incomprehensible. He is indescribable. And his counsel is just mind-boggling. It's difficult for us to understand. And yet the message of Isaiah and the scriptures is that you and I have full access to this wonderful counselor. You and I can come to him boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The scripture tells us that you and I can cast all our cares on him because he cares for you and me. The Bible lets us know that he is touched by the feeling of our infirmities. He knows our weaknesses and he has been tested in every way as we are yet without sin. So this wonderful counselor knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. For in him, Paul says, are all the hidden treasures and wisdom and knowledge. 
He's a wonderful counselor, isn't he? Yeah. Someone wrote <coughs> this free verse. I call him wonderful counselor. As I face the unknown, I know he's out in front of me, leading the way, building my faith as we travel on, my faithful steward for every day. He is my wonderful counselor. My life is secure in his keeping. He won't go to sleep on me. He'll never leave me alone. He'll never get too busy to hear the cries of my heart in the dark. The sun cannot get so bright, nor the moon's shadow so dim, that he'd lose sight of me on the road. He's my shelter wherever I go. I call him Wonderful Counselor. He sends me on uncertain routes. He teaches me trust on each journey. He preserves my soul even in death. He is my shepherd guiding me home. Can you say amen? amen. Yes, Jesus is the answer for the world today. He's not an answer. He is the answer. And above him, there is no other. For Jesus is the way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isaiah saw him as a wonderful counselor, but he saw him as more than just that. That would have been enough. And yet, Isaiah says, his name shall be called the Mighty God. Now, we who believe in the oneness of God and understand the Godhead refer to this passage to demonstrate that Jesus is not some junior God in the Godhead, but that he is the Mighty God. And I'm so glad I'm not confused on that matter. Jesus is God manifested in the flesh, according to Timothy. He is God in human form. He is the visible image of an invisible God. He is the Savior, and He is the Lord of mankind. Can I get an amen? amen. But this passage here means so much more than Jesus is the mighty God. Uh, it says He is the mighty God. Or the God of might. What the picture Isaiah was getting, yes, he's a wonderful counselor. He's indescribable. He's awesome. He's incredible. It's mind-boggling when you think about this wonderful counselor. But he goes on to say he is the mighty God or the God who has might. The words almighty God, El Shaddai, appears 49 times in the Old Testament and nine times in the New Testament. It means one who holds sway over all things, the ruler of all. It means the destroyer or overpower, the all-powerful, the almighty. I think of that when God appeared to Abraham in Genesis, the 17th chapter, verses 1 and 2. Abraham was 90 years old, and God said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. How could God say that? Because he's Almighty. He goes on and uses that phrase again to Abraham in Genesis 35. In verse 11, he says, I am almighty God. I want you to know, folks, God is in charge. Amen? Amen. God is in charge. He rules and he reigns over all. But Isaiah understood the meaning of this phrase, the mighty God, better than we know it today. There is a phrase used more than 250 times in the Old Testament. It's a common title for, for God. It is the phrase, and you'll remember it, the Lord of hosts. It means the Lord of armies, or Jehovah Sabaoth. It refers to God. And here's what Isaiah is saying. His name shall be called the mighty God. It refers to God as a mighty warrior. A mighty war commander-in-chief of the armies of the Lord, which are innumerable and without number. So when Isaiah wrote, his name shall be called the mighty God, he understood what that meant. 
The one who is coming, this child, this son that is given, he is a mighty warrior, a mighty commander of the Lord of armies. Now, I want you to get this today, folks. We celebrate the babe in Bethlehem this time of the year. But Isaiah says this son is a mighty warrior and commander. This is the one who appeared to Moses out of the burning bush. And he told Moses in Exodus, the 15th chapter, verse 3, The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Moses needed to hear that. Because Moses was facing the greatest army of his time. The Egyptian army was what we would consider a, the, the major power, superpower of its day. And yet when God appeared to Moses, he wanted him to know that the Lord is a warrior. And that the Lord is his name. In other words, there's nothing impossible for our God. In the book of Joshua, the third chapter, or fifth chapter, verses 13 through chapter 6 and 2, there's a story about Joseph and Jericho. You know the story very well. Jericho is a city fortified completely. It has never been defeated. It has never been taken. The walls are like 30 stories high. And they're so wide that they used to have chariot races on the top of it. It was completely self-staining. They could shut the doors of the gates and they could exist indefinitely within the city of Jericho. It was just no small city. It was a, as the scripture says, it was tightly shut up. Nobody went in and nobody went out. And it would take a miracle from God in order for this young Hebrew nation to defeat such a major awesome city to break through their defenses. Well, God appears to Joshua and when Joshua sees a man standing before him with a drawn sword in his hand, Joshua says to this man, are you for us or are you for our enemies? And the reply was, neither. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. The scripture says, then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked, what message does my Lord have for his servant? In chapter 6, verse 2, the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. I'm sure Joshua is reminded of what God said to him in the very first chapter of Joshua, verse 9. Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord, your God, will be with you wherever you go. Don't you think that's a good word from the Lord? Amen. Amen. Now, God made that same promise to you and me in the New Testament. In Hebrews, the 13th chapter, verse 5, the Lord says to you and me today, right here, right now, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will never leave you or forsake you. In the original Greek, it means never, no, never, no, never leave you. The emphasis is on God will never forsake his people. That's something to rejoice in God about. You see, we doubt God sometimes. We ask him, where are you, Lord? What are you going? Where, where, where are you when I, when I need you? Have you left me alone? Will you save me from this thing that I am going through? <clears throat> What's going on, God? Well, let me finish the story of Joshua. Joshua in the battle of Jericho. That commander, that mighty warrior, the one seen, caused this fortified city's walls to fall down flat. Now, when I was in Sunday school, they used to talk about the walls, you know, caving out. Well, these walls were so big that if they went out, and fell down out. That the armies of Israel could not have climbed the rubble to get to their armies. And the scripture is clear when it says these walls fell down flat. The earth just opened up, and these massive walls that surrounded that city 
became level to the ground. And the Bible says every man went straight in. Didn't have to climb over anything. He didn't have to. You see, God is a God of details, folks. God is a God of details. And when he said, Joshua, I have given you this city. Know that I am the mighty warrior. I am the commander of the armies of the Lord. There is no wall too high. There is no wall too thick that I cannot take care of, Joshua. And I'm here to tell you today that he is a warrior and he's in this service today and he will take care of you and he will take care of me. The prophet Micah said, therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the host or armies of heaven standing beside him to the right and to the left. Micah got a glimpse of God and the armies of the Lord. And what did Luke say in chapter 2, verse 13, at the birth of Jesus Christ? And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God. That word host means armies. When Jesus Christ was born on this planet, the heavens opened up and the armies of the Lord began to praise God for what the Lord was doing. I want you to know he is an awesome God. He is the mighty God. And you know, we should, we should do the same thing. I said we should do the same thing even in this service today. If the armies of the Lord and the angel and the armies of the Lord could praise God at the birth, should we not hear on this Sunday morning, raise our hands, our hearts, our voices, and say, God, I praise you because you are in charge. You are in charge. <laughs> I hear the psalmist say, Psalm 24, I don't love this passage. I remember we sang a song at Gateway College that had this, this in it, and I, I loved it then. Almost like a three or four hundred year old uh, uh, hymn. But the psalmist said, 24, verses 7 through 10, lift up your heads. O ye gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? Did we not sing about that? Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord is mighty to save. David said to the Philistine, that giant, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. The Lord of armies, my commander, my general, my mighty God, I come to you as a mighty, in the name of the mighty warrior God, the God of the armies of Israel. Sometimes we face our, our enemy giants in this life. We tremble like Israel, not knowing what to do. Don't know how we're going to gain the victory with such a powerful enemy. I'm here to remind you on this Christmas season his name shall be called the mighty God, the mighty warrior. He is our hero. And I'm here to tell you, he has never lost a battle. Listen to the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 20, verse 11. But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. So my persecutors were stumbled and not prevail. The word that's used here in the original Hebrew means dread warrior or champion, awe-inspiring, in great power, strong, terrible, or striking terror. Jeremiah says, but the Lord is with me. And he's like a mighty warrior. He's awesome. He's inspiring. He's great. He's terrible. He's a dread warrior. He is a champion. Zephaniah. Chapter 3, verse 17, the Lord, your God, is with you. Can you say amen? amen? 
the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. This mighty warrior, this mighty God who knows us better than we know ourselves, who knows the very hair on our head, the number of hair on our head. He knows our thoughts before we speak them. He knows our heart. Zephaniah says, that God, that warrior, that champion is with you. The mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. Sometimes we don't delight in ourselves. Sometimes we say, well, I'm not worthy for God to take delight in me. And yet the Bible says he does. He takes the great delight in you. He says, and in his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. A number of years ago, I... I, I and you can check it out for yourself. You never find in, I, I know we tell the Christmas stories and we say the angels were singing, but the Bible doesn't say the angels sang. You will not find any place in the Holy Scriptures where an angel sang. Angels don't sing. You say, what about the birth of Jesus? It says, and they said, Glory to God in our lives. Didn't say they sang. There's only two, two that I know that sing. God sings, and his redeemed sing. <laughs> you and I get to do something with God that only God and us can do. And that is we can sing to our mighty warrior, our mighty God. I mean, I get the picture. We think about, you know, there's Joseph and Mary and hovering over this little babe, and yet Zephaniah, the prophet, says, this mighty warrior, this mighty Lord of hosts, this mighty God rejoices over you and me with singing. What a God. What a Savior. Somebody says, well, you know, I've, I've not lived like I should. Well, today's a good day to remedy that. Today's a good day to say, God, take me from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. I give myself completely to you because he is mighty to save. You may be lost and undone, but I want you to know you may not be able to find your way. But God is mighty to save. You say, there's too much against me. I love this passage in Isaiah, the 59th chapter, sometimes mis misquoted. But it says, when the enemy comes in. We always heard when the enemy comes in like a flood. Well, the comma's in the wrong place. It says when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise a standard against him. That's where the comma belongs. It's our God, our mighty warrior, our champion. When the enemy attacks you and me like a flood, he comes rushing in to protect you and me. And to give us the peace that we need in our hearts and our lives. Like a flood, he stands up as a barrier against the enemy. And I remember in 2 Kings, the 6th chapter, there's a story. Verses 13 through 17 talks about Elijah surrounded by an enemy. It's the king of Aram at Dothan. And the king wanted to kill Elijah, so he sent his armies to surround him and his servant, Elijah. Uh, the servant of the Lord tells his own servant, it's just the two of them there in the house. I mean, his servant's panicking. He's about to have a nervous breakdown. He is terrified. And Elijah says, don't be afraid. Those that are with us are more than they that be with them. And I can, I can see it now. His servant said, there's you and there's me. And he looks out the window and they're completely surrounded by the enemy's army. And... It was no comfort to him to hear the words of Elijah saying, there's more with us than there are with them. So Elijah prays a prayer. And he says, Lord, open the eyes of my servant that me may see. It wasn't, it wasn't a big prayer. It was just a very simple prayer. Lord, open the eyes of my servant that he may see. 
And when the servant's eyes were opened and he looked out the window of the house that was surrounded by the enemy, in the heavens surrounding all of them was horses and chariots. The Bible says he saw the hills full of horses and chariots and fire all around them. Our God is the mighty God. He is the mighty warrior. I don't care what has surrounded you. There's, there's something that has surrounded them and surrounded you that's greater than all the forces of the enemies that can bring against you. You see, the commander of armies is with us whether we see them or not. I pray that our eyes will be opened and that we will see that our God whom we worship today and whom we serve is a mighty God. He's a mighty warrior. He's a commander in chief that's never lost a battle. They that be with him are more than those that come against us. As we celebrate this Christmas season and the birth of baby Jesus coming to earth, let us remember what the prophet Isaiah said. His name shall be called Mighty God. And whatever you and I go through, whatever you and I may face, whatever the trial or the tribulation, the sickness or disease, the mountain or valley or river, remember the words of the prophet. His name shall be called the Mighty God. Now, I want to leave you with a couple things here as we finish today. First, there's something I want you to remember. Many times in the Old Testament, the armies of Israel made the mistake of trusting in their own military might to save them. But God taught them one important lesson, and that is this. The battle is the Lord's. The battle is not yours. Are you a child of God? I mean, how many parents here, if your small child was facing danger, it's not their battle. You're going to rush in there and you're going to battle. That's the same imagery that God uses for you and me. He tells me whatever it is you're facing, it's not your battle, it's mine. I will handle it. I will take care of it. David told Goliath, and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword or spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. The battle is the Lord's. When King Hezekiah faced an enemy, a massive enemy, massive armies, he told the people in 2 Chronicles, the 32nd chapter, verse 2, he says, with him, his enemies he's talking about, with him is only the arm of the flesh. But with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. Folks, with us, can I hear it today? With us, we have a mighty warrior. We have a champion. We have a mighty God. With them, all they have is the arm of the flesh. But with us, we have the mighty arm of Almighty God. So what do I mean by that? Yes, we are called to battle against the forces of spiritual darkness and the enemies of Jesus Christ. And so many times we're too passive and we're just kind of wimpy when we're in the face of a strong foe. But the Apostle Paul says, fight the good fight of faith. Our faith is not in our abilities. Our faith is not what we can do. It's not in our intelligence or the degrees on the wall, or our bank account, or the job we have, or the reputation or character we may have in a community. Our strength does not come from us, or the arm of the flesh. It comes from our mighty God. Our mighty God. Jesus told his disciples, Luke 22nd chapter, verse 46, in the garden against him, and he says, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. We need to pray and seek the face of God in the face of the enemy. Well, Martin Luther wrote a song. It's a popular hymn, 400 years or more old. A mighty fortress is our God. 
If you are a child of God here today, you belong to Him, and His name has been applied to your life. If you've had a new birth experience, I want you to know that our God is the mighty God. And this Christmas season, you know, we, all, we, we sing the song often, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are saved. And we go on to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. That name is mighty to save today. It's mighty to help you wherever you are. You see, our life is full of limitations and roadblocks. But the one we worship this morning is limitless. Nothing is impossible. We sang earlier, he made a way. When my back was against the wall and it looked as if it was over, he made a way. And I'm standing here only because he made a way. Is that the God we can worship today? Is that the God we can honor today and praise without reservation? He moves mountains. He causes walls to fall. And with his power, he performs miracles. There is nothing that's impossible. And we're standing here only because he made a way. He is the mighty God who transcends space and time and hearts and monies and obstacles and economy and do doctors and paychecks and governments and courts. Let me close with a couple passages here. Isaiah said in chapter 43, verses 11 through 13, he says, I am the Lord. There is no other Savior. First, I predicted your deliverance. I declared what I would do, and then I did it. I saved you. No foreign God has ever done this before. You are witnesses that I am the only God, says the Lord. From eternity to eternity, I am God. No one can oppose what I do. No one can reverse my actions. His name shall be called. The mighty God. And then Paul, in Romans the 8th chapter, says, Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? Will God? No. He is the one who has given us the right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? Will Jesus Christ? No. For he is the one who died for us and raised us to life for us and is sitting at the right, the place of the highest honor next to God pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ today in Christ's love? Does it mean he is no long, that he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or are hungry or cold or in danger or threatened with death? Even the scriptures say, for your sakes we are killed all the day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, over Overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced, he goes on to say, that nothing can ever separate us from his love. Death can't. Life can't. Angels can't. And the demons can't. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, or even the powers of hell can't keep God's love Away, whether we are high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing in all of God's creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He is a mighty, mighty, mighty one. Amen. A mighty one. Paul ends book of Ephesians, or begins the book of Ephesians, reminding the church, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. Did you hear that? What is God's rich and glorious inheritance? His people. That's you and me. That he knows by name. That he knows all about us. 
But he doesn't stop there. He says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he, talking about Christ, is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. Oh, let's stand to our feet. <laughs> His name shall be called the mighty. The mighty warrior. He is the one who's in this service today. Praise God. He is the one that's standing right here, right now, in this auditorium. He loves you more than you can know. He cares about you more than you can understand. He knows your name, knows all about you, knows your faults and your weaknesses, he even knows your sins, and yet he's a mighty God to save. Wouldn't you want to serve a God like that? Wouldn't you want to give your all to a God like that? Would you not want to surrender to a God like that? Amen. There's a new song we're going to be singing here. We're going to try it on you right now. I'd like for you to take somebody by the hand and I want you to step forward just for a few moments, just for a few moments here this morning. It goes like this. It, this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. 